The National World War II Museum in New Orleans is conducting oral histories to record the experiences of World War II veterans and those Americans living and working on the home front. In the upcoming interview, former United States Senator and 1972 Democratic presidential nominee George McGovern recalls volunteering for the United States Army Air Forces after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. He was 19. McGovern flew 35 combat missions over enemy territory and earned the Distinguished Flying Cross for his heroism. This is the first of two parts. The second half of this interview will air Sunday on C-SPAN 3. This program is just under one hour. I'm George McGovern, George Stanley uh, McGovern. I was born in Avon, South Dakota, July 19th, 1922. Now, whereabouts is Avon? Avon is 60 miles south of Mitchell, South Dakota, which is a somewhat larger town. Mitchell now has about 15,000 people. When I was growing up here, it was around 10 or 11,000. Populations don't change much in uh, South Dakota with the passage of time. We have a fairly high birth rate and a very low death rate, but uh, in this state uh, I'd say uh, many, many people leave by the time they get through high school, so the population stays about the same. South Dakota's total population is about the same today as it was when I was born. Wow, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's 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 incredible. And uh, did you did you grow up there? I spent the first um, three years in Avon, and then we moved to uh, Calgary, Alberta. My mother was a Canadian-born citizen, and her mother became ill uh, and so my father arranged a transfer to uh, Calgary and we were there for the next three years and uh, we then moved to Mitchell, South Dakota. I was, I turned six on that trip from Calgary to uh, Mitchell and this has been my hometown ever since, ever since 1928. And so I guess you went to um, high school and college here? I went all the way through 12 years, the Mitchell Public School System. Uh, it was an excellent system. Uh, in those days, uh, teachers were all, almost married to their students. They were so dedicated. Many of them were uh, spinsters who had never married. Um, and uh, I had the, the most wonderful teachers in this town. I don't know how uh, women and also the few men that I had uh, could have been more dedicated than they were in this city. I count myself very fortunate. Uh, some of my children had some of the same teachers when they were uh, growing up. Um, I went to Dakota Wesson, which is right across the street from here. We built a beautiful new library and public service uh, center. Incidentally, Stephen Ambrose was in Mora, where uh, two of the most generous contributors to this new building. Uh, we dedicated that in early October. It's named the George and Eleanor McGovern Library and Public Service Center. How nice. <laughs> I went off to uh, school after World War II uh, to Northwestern University on the GI Bill. I went all the way through to a PhD in history. Those were four of the happiest years of my life. Um, my wife, of course, was with me and uh, we had um, uh, three children at that time, and it was just a great time. That GI Bill may have been one of the most uh, creative and productive and valuable uh, pieces of legislation ever passed. Um, they call us the greatest generation, that wartime generation, if we were. 
it was because in considerable part of the GI Bill of Rights, uh, it enabled millions of young guys who never would have even thought about college uh, to go to the college of their choice and go all the way through. So uh, that contributed a lot to the so-called greatest generation. Of course, there were other factors. The, the uh, stealing of the war, the, that is the hardening, the firming up of our resolve physically, <clears throat> mentally, emotionally, survival demanded it. I suppose the third factor would be the Great Depression. That helped to hone us and refine us and <laughs> produce stronger people. So um, all of those things uh, contributed to my education and to my learning and to my knowledge and to whatever wisdom I have. <clears throat> I know that one of the things that um, Mr. Brokaw points out in the book Greatest Generation is that uh, for so many of your generation that your experience in the military prepared you for uh, later success in the private and the public sector. Do you agree with that idea? I do agree with that. I think the uh, act of training and service and dedication of World War uh, II, incidentally the last war that the whole country uh, was behind, every war we've had since then has been controversial some of them highly controversial, but that war we were all united, we knew it was necessary. And by the way, Tom Brokaw was born and reared in South Dakota. He was born at Yankton, about 90 miles uh, southeast of Mitchell, spent his early life in this state, graduated from the University of South Dakota. So the author of the greatest generation began right here in South Dakota. <clears throat> How about that? Um, when you entered service in the U.S. Army, were you a volunteer or were you drafted? I was a volunteer. <clears throat> I signed up to the uh, Air Force. I wanted to be a pilot. I even knew what kind I wanted to be. I wanted to be a bomber pilot. I had taken a civilian pilot training course at Dakota Wesley in this little school across the street from where we're now speaking. Um, we uh, soloed at the end of eight hours and then we got another uh, another 27 hours, I think it was a total of 35 all, all together. So I got an interest in the uh, Air Force and in flying at that time. I think I took that course in 1941. And um, uh, at first, you know, I'd never been in an airplane before. At first I was terrified, but I stuck it out and after eight hours I was able to fly, and circle over Lake Mitchell, circle over Dakota Wesley and familiar landmarks uh, below. And so when the uh, war came along, Pearl Harbor hit us on December 7th, 41. I was then a sophomore. I volunteered, uh, 19 years of age, but the Air Force didn't have enough planes, training planes, they didn't have enough instructors, they didn't have enough airfields, they didn't have enough of anything to take everybody who was volunteering. So I wasn't actually called uh, into service until February of 43. I got another year in at uh, Dakota Wesleyan after I had had just signed up. So that's how I ended up in the Air Force. <clears throat> so what did you it, it wasn't called an Air Force in those days. It was you either joined the Army Air Corps or the Navy Air Corps. Um, ten of us decided to make a trip to the recruiting stations in Omaha and sign up either for the Army Air Corps or the Navy Air Corps. We weren't sure which one when we left uh, Mitchell to drive. We borrowed one car from the dean and one from the president. No student in those days had a car. That was right after the Great uh, Depression. And uh, we got into Omaha after a few hours driving 
and one of the guys picked up a rumor that if you went to the Army Air Corps recruiting station, they'd give you a, a meal ticket free to some cafeteria in downtown cafeteria, downtown Omaha. It was probably worth about a dollar. And on the strength of that unsubstantiated rumor, and a meal ticket worth about a dollar, all ten of us signed up with the Army Air Corps. It's the cheapest I've ever sold out. <laughs> so, so why did you want to specifically be a bomber pilot? I just saw those big bombers uh, overhead. Uh, Mitchell uh, was a kind of a satellite for the larger base in Sioux City, Iowa. And occasionally, you'd see these big B-24 bombers uh, lumber into uh, Mitchell. I even got a glimpse of the uh, pilot uh, a couple of times when they were on the ground. I thought they were the greatest heroes on earth. And uh, I suppose that had something to do with it. The quickening of interest in, the, um, in flying came from this civilian pilot training program, but the actual determination that if I did get in the Air Corps, what I'd like to fly as a B-24, I think was based on seeing those big bombers uh, come in here to, to Mitchell. It was no profound uh, reason for it, any more than the decision to go to the Army Air Corps the, rather than the Navy Air Corps. That wasn't based, based on any careful analysis. So you make those decisions in time of war, but uh, they can change your life or end it. So in February 43, uh, you finally get called up to active duty. Where did you go when that started? I went to Jefferson Barracks uh, outside of St. Louis. It was just an old-fashioned Army uh, training uh, station there. And we got 30 days of uh, just hard, basic training. It had nothing to do with the Air Force. It was just we learned how to march. We learned how to uh, police up the area. We learned how to keep our bunks uh, clean. Uh, we, um, we, le we learned how to do endless calisthenics to harden us up uh, physically. And uh, so that was my introduction to the Air Force. It wasn't really an air base. It was just a place where they had openings to do those 30 days of basic training. <clears throat> okay. And after basic training, I guess you went off to your primary flight instruction. Uh, yes. We, um, what we did, um, uh, they were still somewhat short on... Um, uh, instructors and pilots so they uh, and uh, airplanes so they sent us back to college for five years at some college in the area there I was sent to the University of Southern Illinois it was then called Southern Illinois Normal University it was a teacher's college and there we learned something about meteorology something about aircraft mechanics, uh, something about um, um, a number of different uh, academic uh, subjects that related to the Air Force, but basically we trained and trained and trained physically. They had an instructor there who was a physical education man at that school, and he knew this war was going to be serious. And he knew we were headed to flying as air cadets. So for five months, he put us through the most intensive physical training you can imagine. One of the things we had to do every day was run five miles as fast as we could go. He had us attempt that on the first day. Of course, guys couldn't do it, couldn't run five miles. And so he'd put along behind us in an old Chevrolet I said to him one day, you know, uh, Coach, uh, I've got a side ache. He said, see if you can't run that out. And so I staggered along there holding my side. And uh, <laughs> to my surprise, I eventually did run it out. But that was the kind of 
disciplinary he was. We had to do push-ups until you thought your arms would break. Sit-ups, pull-ups, um, all kinds of physical exercises. And those classes would uh, sometimes last a couple of hours. So what I got out of that was to turn my body into sinews of steel. I was as hard as a rock by the time I left Southern Illinois <laughs> Normal University. Makes me shudder yet to think about the place, although it was actually a delightful community, Carbondale, Illinois. <clears throat> and so how long were you there? Five months. That's the longest by far that I was anywhere in the Air Corps except when I was sent overseas. I was in Italy about a year. And then came, um, um, then came um, another month at San Antonio, Texas. Um, and that was a different kind of physical training, but we also had some academic training there too. We were at uh, uh, Kelly Field, an adjunct at Kelly Field. I was there just about a month, and then to primary. Muskogee, um, Oklahoma, PT-19, Fairchild PT-19. And so I said to this man, Tom Cooper, a longtime friend of mine, uh, he said, what did you fly in um, the Air Force? I said, you mean everything? Well, he said, just a couple. I said, well, you probably never heard of this at PT-19. <clears throat> it was built by Fairchild. He said, I got one out in the hangar, World War II plane, in mint condition. He said, would you like to fly it? I said, well, gosh, Tom, I haven't piloted an airplane in so long, I can't remember the last time. I don't have a license. He said, well, let's see what you do after all these years. So the, the seats, one in front and one in back, just two seats. The instructor sat in front and the student in and back. And um, so he taxied out to the run. I didn't even know where the runway is, was, but he taxied out there. And um, he said, now let's see if you can take it off. I said, oh gosh, Tom, I, I can't take this thing off. He said, yeah, just go ahead, take over. I'll, I'll follow you on the controls up here in front. He said, okay, so I opened the throttle, we started down, it was a little wobbly, but I got it off the ground. And then he said, well, let's do a few circles around here. So we flew around. You know, it's a strange thing. I had no difficulty at all after all these years flying that airplane. I wouldn't have gone up alone after all that time, but I had no difficulty. He said, well, now let's see if you can land it. So we came in, I found the field, and gradually let down, and, and uh, he followed it down. He says, you better start leveling off about here, you know, which I did. I set it in with no trouble. So that built my morale up again. I figured I'm ready for another war. You ready to fly B-24s again? <laughs> yeah. Well, it would take considerably more than that to fly that B-24 now, but I think I'd pick it up. And, short order, a few days time probably. It's kind of like typewriting or playing the piano. You may be rusty, but you don't forget those basic elements of it. Sure, I could fly today. Fortunately, nobody wants me to do that, so I, I, I'm not going to break my neck at this stage or somebody else's neck. Now, was PT-19 an open cockpit airplane? Yes. Open cockpit, you wore a helmet, goggles, and everything. <clears throat> I, was <clears throat> I was married when I was in flight training at Muskogee, Oklahoma. My future father-in-law, Earl Stegerberg, uh, I'd been dating Eleanor for a couple of years then, he tried to talk us out of getting married until after the war. He, he, never, he never really said this, but I think it was because he thought I, I wouldn't come back. 
going over there. So, and um, he didn't want me to leave Eleanor a widow for the same reason. She was determined we were going to get married before I went over. <laughs> she, she, uh, she also thought there's a good possibility, and that's why she wanted to. Well, then he says, for God's sakes, don't get pregnant until George comes home. For the same reason, she wanted to get <laughs> uh, pregnant, which she did. Took a while. Uh, we were in. Uh, um, I was in Omaha, where all this started, to pick up my bomber crew. I'd gone through primary training at Muskogee, basic training at Coffeyville, Kansas, advanced training at um, Liberal, Kansas. Um, then I picked up my crew in um, Omaha and then went to Mountain Home, Iowa, where I flew with my new crew for couple of months. Every place you went was only a couple of months. After that five months at Carbondale and ground school. Um, so that's where I got my uh, crew in, um, in Omaha. And apparently, um, you know, I've got to, I'm getting ahead of myself. We flew into Omaha, but then we went to Lincoln. Uh, because that was where we met our crews in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, Omaha was a, a convenient landing place, but they had an airport in, in Lincoln too. And so we, uh, after just a short time in Omaha, we went to Lincoln. And that's where I picked up my nine crew members. And that's where Eleanor got pregnant. Um, so we had several months together. We had um, two months in uh, Mountain Home, Idaho with my crew. We then went to Topeka, Kansas for just a few days. And then from there to um, Norfolk, Virginia, actually a little base called Patrick Henry, and then overseas landed in Italy and the war was on for me. Wow, so you <clears throat> flew it overseas. What route did you take? Well, I, uh, I went to Norfolk and uh, you, some people went by ship and some flew over depending on the availability of aircraft. Uh, we thought we were going to fly over but at the last minute they shifted us to a troop ship. So I had a month at sea uh, in an old uh, commercial liner that the Americans had captured from the Germans early, fairly early in the war. It was not exactly the Queen Mary. It was an uncomfortable ride. They had it stacked up five deep with about that much width uh, between the booths uh, ahead of you. And, uh, but somehow we all enjoyed it. Uh, it was in um, late summer, early fall. The weather was nice. We were heavily escorted because the Germans were then intercepting ships and they were especially trying to intercept a ship like that carrying uh, uh, about uh, 3,000 Air Force personnel. So we had submarines escorting us, we had destroyers, a couple of cruisers. And it was a heavy, heavily escorted uh, trip over. We didn't give it a thought. I mean, we figured the real danger was ahead once we started flying missions. <clears throat> so did you sail, what port did you sail to in England? We went into Naples. We didn't go right to, to England. We went from uh, Norfolk to um, um, Naples, Italy. <clears throat> and um, at that point, I'm assuming that that's where you joined your squadron. And what squadron and group were you in? I was in the 741st Squadron, the 455th Bomb Group, and we were attached as part of the 15th Air Force. 
the commanding officer was General Nathan Twining, and he remained commander all during the time I was in, uh, in Italy. We uh, <clears throat> had some interesting experiences on the ground as well as uh, on the air. I'm not going to tell you about all the experiences on the ground, but we, uh, it was an exciting time. Um, the very first time I touched any European port or soil was Naples, Italy on this uh, sea trip to get into combat. As we pulled into Naples Harbor, beautiful harbor, you could see on either side of the docking area um, a large number of little children, little kids, four, five, on up into the teens, must have been several hundred uh, that were meeting that ship on the docking area, and they were yelling at us. We, they didn't speak much English, but we could make out a few words. Um, and as we got a little closer, you could hear kids saying, Baby Ruth! Butterfingers, Hershey bars. At that point, the captain of the ship broke in over the loudspeaker and he said, um, do not throw anything off this ship to those children. This is wartime Italy. Those kids are near starvation. Kids around the world like candy but they've learned, watching the ships come in here, that that's what GIs have right with them, a candy bar or something. And they're starving. And so they yell for what you have. And he said, yesterday, an American troop ship came in there. I've forgotten whether he said yesterday or a few days ago, but a troop ship came in here and the youngsters were yelling to the ship, and uh, 25 of them jumped off into the water to try to fish out some of these candy bars. And um, there was such a scramble for it that a couple of dozen children drowned. And so uh, do not throw anything to those youngsters. So that was my introduction to the problem of hunger in the world. Of course, today, Italy is probably the, the best fed country in the world. You've got to work hard to find a bad restaurant in Rome or Naples or wherever. Uh, not so in World War II. I think the first morning I woke up, I was in a little tent over on the other side of Italy by then, at, outside of a little village of Sherignola. It's over on the uh, east Coast, just off the spur on the Italian uh, boot. And I heard this scratching. Uh, it must have been, I don't know, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, but it woke me up. And there were some voices, and I looked out, and here were a group of young Italian women, probably young mothers, scratching through our garbage dump trying to find bits of food that they could take home to their children. When we'd go into this little village, um, it was probably, a, I call it a little village, there were several thousand people there. We'd see the same women that we had seen in the morning um, selling themselves on the street for a few dollars to um, get a little income for their families, for their uh, children. So that was my uh, introduction to Italy. It's an interesting thing. I've been interested in that problem of world hunger ever since. Can you believe that? That's where it began. Well, that's a powerful experience, and I can certainly yeah. understand yeah. how it touched yeah. you. It was very, uh, very uh, moving. You know, I was uh, trying to tell you that story and it almost broke me up because it uh, just to see uh, the images of those little kids. And the, even to this day, it, 
it uh, it touches me. Yeah. Uh, that's something I've never had to deal with in my life, and I don't expect that I ever will. No. Well, you know, growing up here in uh, South Dakota, it, we we were poor during the Depression. There weren't any rich people <laughs> in this state during the, the Great Depression when I was growing up. But very few people ever went hungry because this is a food-producing state. And you could always, if you were riding the rails, as many young men were, um, they'd jump off whatever car they were on, the railway car, when they slowed down at Mitchell. And they'd um, go in and knock on your door and ask if um, you could spare a sandwich. or And they'd always say, we'd be willing to cut your lawn or whatever. Um, so I saw that kind of hunger, but nobody was laying down starving to death during that period. This is the first time I came to grips with... Uh, either starvation or near starvation. And um, from that day to this, that's been one of the passions of my life. It's so inexcusable that we have billions of hungry people in this uh, world. And so that, that's been a big passion of mine. And I suppose as much as any other single American, I've fed more people I say I fed, I got the government to do it or got the UN to do it, than any other person on the planet. Hundreds of millions of people will be fed through Food for Peace in the um, Kennedy days when I was the director of the Food for Peace program. And then under Clinton for four years, I was sent back to uh, Italy uh, as ambassador to the UN Food and Agricultural Organizations there. And so um, we've, we've, I was responsible for programs that literally fed hundreds of millions of people. It would dwarf anything that Herbert Hoover did at the end of the First World War. I don't say that boastfully, it's just part of my, my life, part of my history. Well, it sounds like <clears throat> your experience in Italy well, it obviously inspired your, your thoughtfulness about world hunger. Do you yeah. think that your experiences during World War II um, contributed to your aspirations to um, enter the political realm? Not really. I hadn't thought about politics at that point. I just thought if I ever get an opportunity to, you know, to do something about this, I will. But I didn't think about politics. I, I was too interested in coming home and getting a PhD in history. History was my big love at that point. I should tell you, the first year after um, um, I um, got back, I finished up here at Westland, and then I went off to seminary for nine months. I thought maybe I should follow my dad's footsteps, but it was probably a break for both the church and for me <laughs> that I only lasted nine months, and then I just simply moved across the campus from Garrett Seminary into the history department at Northwestern University where I had long had this great uh, interest. But you know there is something about the atomic bomb and the fact that for the first time man had the capacity to wipe out all living things on this planet. Never had that before that I think a lot of people thought, well, we haven't got time to do much, but maybe if we can start working on changing the heart of man, the world around, we might yet survive in this nuclear uh, age. So you made kind of big leaps of faith, and I think that explained my uh, brief entry into seminary. I thought it was going to take an act of God, I guess, to save the world. <laughs> But I, I quickly realized that was not my calling, if I could use that phrase. And so I started studying history at, at uh, Northwestern University. Have you always been interested in history? Yeah. I majored in it in college. My favorite teacher in high school was the history teacher. He also coached debate, which is another 
lifetime interest in mine. I've been arguing with people ever since. <laughs> That's interesting. I we have that in common because I was I was inspired by a history teacher in high school who was also the debate coach. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, frequently debate coaches were uh, history teachers or social science teachers. They developed an interest in issues and pros and cons of the debate history tie, and it's quite logical, don't you think? I think so. Yeah. So, so what was the subject of your PhD dissertation? Um, the Colorado Coal Strike of 1913 and 14. That was suggested by the late uh, Arthur Link. He was my um, um, dissertation director. I was his first student uh, to do a dissertation. And so the first dissertation he ever directed was mine. And it was a good topic. And the reason he suggested it is he was working on a multi-volume biography of Woodrow Wilson. He later edited all of the Wilson papers. And it's a model of how public papers should be uh, edited. but. Uh, in 1949 and 50, when I was nearing the end of my residence days at Northwestern, he asked me what I was going to do my dissertation on, and I, I threw out three or four topics. He says, you know, I've got one that I think is just right for you. It's manageable, and I discovered it in my researches on Woodrow Wilson. Uh, because Wilson had to send in federal troops to settle this uh, really violent uh, coal mining strike in Colorado. And, I, and nobody's ever written the history of that in any definitive way. And I think you could do that in a, in a year, button it up, which I did. I came out here to teach, and while I was teaching at Dakota Wesleyan, I wrote that dissertation. I did a year of travel before I came to Wesleyan. I worked uh, out in the archives in Colorado. I worked at the Library of Congress. I worked at the New York Public Library. I worked in the files of the uh, United Mine Workers. So there are uh, lots of uh, uh, previous exposure. So by the time I got here, about all I had to do was the writing. I had the research all done. I was teaching full time, but I finished it up you know, about a year and got my doctorate. That was 1953. The interesting thing about it, I never really um, used that doctorate in a career sense. Uh, because I got it in June of 53, and a month later I agreed to work full-time trying to organize a Democratic Party in South Dakota. And um, I thought I'd do that for a year or so. The <clears throat> uh, University of Iowa was looking for a professor in recent American history, and um, I, I applied for it first. And, came, and it finally narrowed down to two people. I think they had something like a hundred applications. They finally narrowed it down to a guy from Harvard and um, myself from Northwestern, and the department was really pushing me. Uh, they were under the illusion that I was a brilliant uh, graduate student and would be good at uh, uh, in a major professorship at a Big Ten university like the University of Iowa. But the Harvard guy edged me out, and it was at that point I thought, well, I'm about ready to leave a little school like Wesleyan, and here's this offer to work for a year or so organizing a Democratic Party, and then, you know, I'll apply to a larger school somewhere. I never, never get back into full-time academia, I got so interested in the process of building a grassroots political organization in South Dakota, and I was so fascinated by the quick results I seemed to be getting 
that uh, after uh, two years of that, I ran for the United States Congress, and everybody surprised got elected. And you know the rest of the history. <clears throat> How long did you serve in Congress? Four years in the House. Then I went to the White House uh, with John Kennedy for two years when I ran the Overseas Food for Peace program, a huge food distribution operation. <clears throat> we were sending four million tons of wheat and wheat flour alone just to India uh, during the time I was there. Um, and then after two years of that, 18 years in the United States Senate, uh, interrupted by a run for the presidency in 72. Well, can I jump back? Sure. I love, I want, I'd love to talk uh, about that. Some of this is irrelevant to what you're after. <laughs> but I'm more interested in that, act, almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but can we jump back to sure. uh, Italy? Sure. Um, I want to make sure I have it memorized. 741st Squadron, 455th Group. Mm -hmm. Pop Bomb Group. Mm -hmm. And um, so you picked up your uh, B-24 in Italy. Yes. And yes, it, it was one that had been in combat for some time. <clears throat> What you had to do <clears throat> when you arrived in combat, the pilot had to fly as co-pilot with some experienced crew that had been on a number of missions. You flew as co-pilot for five missions, and then you took your own crew up. So you were always five missions ahead of the rest. I, I flew mine with a wonderful pilot by the name of Howard Serbeck. Of Wash Hugel, Washington. He was maybe the best pilot uh, in the outfit at that time, or one of the best. And he died shortly after the war, had some kind of heart difficulty. He tried to talk me into going into a business with him. His father had a big department store in Wash Hugel. And um, I just you know, I appreciated the offer, but I, I was preparing to go to graduate school, and that was my, <clears throat> my big passion at that time. But anyway, I flew with Howard for five missions, and you know, we'd see these anti-aircraft bursts, and at first I was a little nervous, but I didn't see anybody get hit on the first mission. But boy, I saw plenty of that later. Once in a while, you'd have a milk run where you didn't encounter either fighter planes or anti-aircraft fire. They were rare, but it did happen. And as luck would have it, my first few missions were among the easiest I, I had. What target were you hitting on those first missions? Uh, you know, uh, I don't remember the, the, those first five targets. I did for years afterwards, but They've just kind of blurred into, I, I remember we hit an aircraft uh, factory. We hit a railway marshalling yard, but beyond that, I don't remember the other three in the first. You remember a lot more of the ones you flew yourself. So were those targets actually in Germany? So yeah, they were in Germany, yeah. I think of the first five, maybe um, one might have been to Austria and one to um, um, I think maybe one as far away as Czechoslovakia but um, that's about as far as I can I can carry it in my memory. So from Cerignola, Italy to those in that area, you, that was probably a very long mission. It was. They were long, long missions. Um, the primary target or priority of the 15th Air Force when I was in combat was Hitler's oil refineries, whether they were in Romania or Austria or Germany or wherever. We were after his oil refineries. And um, they were amazingly successful raids. Near the end of the war, we had just shut down the German Air Force because they didn't have any oil. 
one of the German generals later wrote that uh, he knew Germany was done for when he was flying over a combat area late in the war and he noticed a long string of German tanks and they just seemed to be crawling along and when he got down a little closer he realized they were being pulled by horses team you know a squadron of horses in front of each they didn't have any fuel they still could fire the uh, guns but they couldn't uh, and he said when he saw that he knew it was all over just a matter of time that was right near in the closing days of the war <clears throat> you know that I um, flew my last mission the day before the war ended. I'd have been through either way. It was the toughest mission I flew during the war. The reason was that the Germans kept pulling their anti-aircraft guns back. They were being pushed uh, from the east by the Russians who pushed them all the way into Berlin, pushed from the west by General Patton and others. And um, no matter what they say, about the impact of bombing being exaggerated. It certainly wasn't exaggerated when it came to knocking out Hitler's oil supplies. Uh, obviously, the, the main military force that crushed Germany was the Red Army, as you know, 22 million, 22 million Russians killed, but 6 million Germans killed. So that was the real crusher. But uh, as Steve Ambrose says, uh, uh, maybe uh, bombing wasn't as successful in every case as we had expected it to be. And he says, don't ask how we could have won the war without it. And I think that's true. We, we really smashed the oil supply, the, much of the rail traffic, much of the aircraft, the tank factories. Those things were blowing up, and that had a, a big impact in terms of Hitler's capacity to resist. A moment ago, you mentioned your final mission was your toughest mission. Mm -hmm. uh, what? I, I'm assuming that's in May '45. And what that, was your target? Linz, Austria, Hitler's hometown, and they had pulled more anti-aircraft guns in there. As I said, they were coming in from the Russian front. They were coming in from the Western Front, and, and Linz was one of the pooling places. They had more anti-aircraft guns there than I saw during the war. It wasn't the most crucial target, but it was one of the few that was left. And um, we came back from that mission with over a hundred flak holes in that plane. How it stayed in the air, I don't know. I, if I had any doubts about the B-24, they would have been ended that day. They knocked out our brakes, they knocked out our flaps, they knocked out our landing gear. Um, they just shot us to pieces. Only one man was hit, though. The, one of the waste gunners was hit in the thigh, and we had to leave him in Italy at the end of the war. He was in an uh, Italian hospital there. I remember he broke down and cried. I went to, to, to see him. It was a big guy, big guy by the name of Tex uh, Ashlock. He'd be embarrassed if I told you that story in his hearing, but um, uh, that, was a, that was really a rough mission. What we did when we got back to the field, we knew we had neither flaps to slow down the airspeed, no brakes to slow us down on the ground. We knew that runway was only about 5,000 feet long. And so uh, what we did when we hit the ground, we had prepared this in the air, we waited until the wheels touched the ground, then we threw parachutes out of the waste windows. Uh, they were tied to stanchions inside the uh, plane. And uh, they flared up, you know, on each side of the plane. That really slowed us uh, down um, um, and uh, I was able to hold it on the runway 
we finally just eased off the end of the runway. There was a big ditch there, and it, it was just barely rolling then, but I had no brakes even to stop that, so we just kind of slowly went into that ditch and then up in the tail slap down, sprained the ankle on one of the guys who was in the back of the plane. And we had this other guy who was badly wounded. They, of course, had red flares announcing that there were wounded people on board, so the ambulances and everything were out there. But uh, that was the most memorable mission of the war. Had to be the last one. If I had to fly another one like that, I don't think I'd be talking to you today. Did you fly all of those combat missions with the same B-24? No. No, nobody did at that stage of the war. They, um, you, you flew whatever was available. There was one that I flew uh, several times, Yo-Yo. That was also Howard Cervik's plane that he flew most often. But nobody flew 35 missions in the same bomb. First of all, bombers didn't last that long. They were shot down or they were crippled or they were turned into junk. And so the notion that you went over there and flew all your missions in one bomber, I don't know anybody in the 15th Air Force that did that. If there was somebody, I wasn't aware of it. Bombers just didn't last that long. So what did you think of the B-24? It was a magnificent airplane, difficult to fly, um, and especially before they put on hydraulic controls, which we got about halfway through our missions, that changed everything. Well, you know what it's like to drive a truck uh, without, you probably are too young to remember a truck without hydraulic uh, controls, but it was work. To just a physical work to maneuver that plane uh, because of the difficult uh, controls. But it, while it wasn't as easy to fly as a B-17, it could fly faster, it could fly further, uh, it could even fly um, with a heavier bomb load than the B-17. So for those reasons it became the workhorse of the bomber force in World War II. Um, just to illustrate that, we produced uh, 12,000 B-17s, the Flying Fortress. We produced 12,000 of those during World War II, 18,000 B-24s. And one of the reasons that Steve Ambrose wrote that book, The Wild Blue, is that he was ticked off knowing this that the B-17s got a lot more publicity than the um, B-24s. You know why. The B-17s were largely based in England, where everybody spoke English. We were based in Italy or the South Pacific or North Africa, where nobody spoke English. So uh, I suppose that had as much to do with it as, as anything. And also, uh, the B-17s came into the war in large numbers before the B-24 did, so they got the publicity on the early raids the day after Pearl Harbor when we were saturated with people who got distinguished flying crosses and congressional medals of honor uh, early in the war that wouldn't have even been noticed uh, months later when uh, there are thousands of bombers were in the air. I'm sure there were some, but I don't know anybody that got the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor in a B-24 bomber. There probably were some that I'm just not aware of. The only ones I'm aware of are the guys, in fact, one of, uh, back home, one of, Louisiana had six Medal of Honor recipients from World War II, yeah. and one of them, well, actually two of them, flew the Ploesti Romania raid. Well, of course, that was a different, yeah. that, that was, that was I think unique. there were about 10 medals of honor on that raid yeah, alone. That, that was unique to all other raids. Of, uh, I think they lost half the people on that raid. You, uh, you deserve to be decorated if you survived that one. When, when you would fly, I'm thinking of this because I know that at Ploesti, 
the drop altitude was 500 feet. Yeah, what, how, crazy. That, that's Sheer crazy. insanity. How, how high were you when you dropped on your 25,000 feet, 26,000, 24,000, somewhere in that range. You know, unless we were uh, trying to hit the Bremer Pass, um, that itself was probably, I don't know, thousands of feet above the normal. So we went over that at a lower altitude. We never could hit that rail line going through. If you think it's easy to hit right on a single rail track from anything from 15 to 25,000 feet, it shows you've never tried it. It's like, it'd be like trying to bomb a needle from here to that barn over there about three blocks away. It just looked like a little tiny thread there, you know. We'd hit on each side of it. I don't know if a bomb ever fell on that rail line through the Bremer Pass. Well, I mean, what made accuracy possible? Was it just simply the Norton bomb site? The Norton bomb site was the main thing that enabled able us to do that pinpoint bombing. But even with that, if you had a crosswind and you didn't calculate that just right, you, it, it was almost impossible from high altitude to hit a thing like, now you could bomb a marshalling yard, you know, where you got a hundred rail lines coming in from, you can probably come close to disrupting that or accidentally hitting the roundhouse or, uh, you didn't have to hit much if it was a big combine. That might be a, a quarter of a mile wide. You could hit that. But I'll tell you, the Germans rebuilt things like that awfully fast, too. But they couldn't rebuild oil refineries fast. That was a complicated network of machinery. And I think that's where we did the most grievous damage to the German war machine. I mean the most damage from the air.